Hello and welcome to the Private Capital Podcast. I'm Joe Riley. I've been in the family office world for 20 years and I've always been interested in how people make good investment decisions and if it's possible to teach these skills in the family office context. This podcast speaks to investment and business thought leaders as well as founders and experts in the investment world to hear their great stories and insights. Rebecca Patterson was most recently Chief Investment Strategist at Bridgewater Associates, where she was on the Executive Committee and was a frequent author of Bridgewater's Daily Observations. Previously, she was CIO of Bessemer Trust, overseeing $85 billion in client assets. Before joining Bessemer, she worked globally for JP Morgan, where she was Chief Investment Strategist and ran the private bank's global currency and commodity trading desk. Rebecca actually started out as a journalist for the St. Petersburg Times and for Dow Jones. Rebecca is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and is the chair of the board of the Council for Economic Education. Many people want to hear what Rebecca thinks. Today, we discuss how she thinks. How does she do her analysis of the markets and economic issues? How she wrote the daily observations at Bridgewater? how her experience in journalism taught her to rapidly assimilate data and opinion to form a coherent and useful narrative. Please enjoy my engaging conversation with Rebecca Patterson. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Anything said by the guests or host should not be construed as legal or investment advice. Thanks for listening. I always start with someone's background. Okay. I was born in St. Louis, Missouri, but we moved to Florida when I was about three months old. My father worked at the University of Florida doing PR for the university. And then when I was maybe four or five, he and my mom decided to move to the St. Pete Clearwater area where my grandparents were to be closer to them. And they started a small PR firm in a garage next to our house. So I grew up in Florida and I was born and raised a University of Florida Gator. It was great. I. I could go to the beach several days a week after school. It was a five minute bike ride from my house. Learned how to sail. I did synchronized swimming growing up, which Christine Lagarde and I have that in common. Okay, (laughs) I'm sure you talk about it a lot. And studied journalism? But I didn't know what I wanted to study. And my parents had both been journalists. And on a whim, I decided to take a journalism class and it was this aha moment. And journalism was this thing that just came so naturally to me, talking to people, asking questions, trying to summarize my thoughts in a coherent way, doing it quickly. And what was the job market like when you graduated? What did you do? So I graduated in 1990, and I had a Rotary Club scholarship, which allowed you to spend a year doing graduate work overseas but you had to go to a country that wasn't your native language. And I had studied French and a little German growing up. I had never been overseas. We grew up pretty simply. Our summer vacations were usually in the car going north to look at Civil War battlefields. And I thought that was grand. It was awesome. It was fun. I learned a lot about American history. But I wanted to go to France. And I had never been to France. And I thought, well, I shouldn't go to Paris because they'll all speak English there. So I picked Strasbourg off a map having never been there, and landed in Strasbourg, not realizing that I would be learning Alsatian, which is the German-French kind of combo language as much as French. But it was a transformative year for me. I did my courses at the University of Strasbourg, French history, politics, etc. I got what they call a stage, an internship at the Council of Europe, which was my introduction to all things European bureaucracy. I'm an intern and I get to have beautiful lunches with wine every day, these fabulous field trips. We went to Berlin right after the wall fell and got tours and we're bungee jumping around the wall and it was well budgeted, let's put it that way. But it was a good education about the European system and I got to travel quite a bit around Europe in my little De Chevaux when I had free time. And it was also important for me as an American because I would go to these club meetings and the gentlemen in the club, lovely hosts, but they would tease me about being blonde Becky from Florida and I must eat McDonald's every day and so forth. And so it was, it was 
it showed me how people can perceive people from other countries and generalize. And I decided I'm going to prove them wrong. So every piece of food that I had never heard of or seen before they put in front of me, I ate with gusto. And any adventure they would suggest to me, I would do it. And any experience, yep, I'm game. But I wanted to show them that Americans can be as global and open-minded and break the stereotypes, just as I think sometimes in America we hold stereotypes about others. So it was an amazing experience. But after that, I realized I wanted to do something more global. I didn't want to stay in Florida the rest of my life as much as I, I loved growing up there. So when I got back, I got a job with my hometown paper, the St. Petersburg Times in Washington. And I was the kid in the office. I cleaned the fax machine. That's when we had those. But I had a boss, Paul Tash, who probably the best boss I've ever had, who gave me enough rope to hang myself. And I would go on the hill and have to track down senators and representatives and interview them. And the first story I ever did was Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill. Welcome to Washington. And it was just an amazing way to see firsthand how the sausage is made. And you realize the importance of politics and policy. To talk a little bit about the influence of the St. Petersburg Times back then. Yeah, the St. Pete Times is no longer independent, but it was one of the last independent American newspapers and won dozens and dozens of Pulitzers over the years for their reporting, which was just incredibly high quality. So it was, it was an honor to work there. As a kid, basically fresh out of school, it was a big deal to be there. And I still stay in touch with, there was also a great woman there named Eileen Shanahan, who had been one of the first women journalists, not at the St. Pete Times, another paper, to get off the society pages. And I'll never forget when I joined, and this was 1991, she said, you are no longer Becky, you are Rebecca. You are going to tone down the hair and you're gonna get more conservative clothes. And initially I was so offended. Who is this person to tell me how to dress and what to call myself? And she was doing me such a huge favor because to be taken seriously on the Hill, to be able to have conversations with senior government officials to get them to talk to you, I couldn't look 22. It wasn't gonna fly. And, and so it's something I remember now when I see young people, especially young women, just getting into their careers, it's always a difficult, sensitive conversation. But if you can handle it well, I think you can help them. You want, you want to be remembered for who you are, how you think, what you say, not how you look. How would you approach that now? <laughs> Easier for a woman to have a conversation with another woman, I'm guessing. And probably even saying that today is sensitive. And I think just saying that, you want people to think of you for who you are, not how you look, period, full stop. And so if you're doing something, wearing something, behaving in a way that's going to be distracting, that doesn't do you a favor. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't be authentic to who you are. And that's just reality. How did you get your head around the hill? How did you, I'm sure it must have influenced your later interest in policy, but I think sometimes the hill can be a bit of a shock the first time you're Oh, in definitely. It, yeah. I mean, it actually goes on going to hearings and I would be the only woman in the room and the members of Congress looking to the press would say, OK, gentlemen, I thought, hey, hello. So there was that. I worked after St. Pete Times while I was in grad school for another publication called Congressional Quarterly. They had me write bios back in the day. And you realize these are very accomplished people and I should respect what they've been able to do and respect their public service. At the same time, they're flawed humans. Lots of background information that I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't be very proud of. And that was a wake up call <laughs> to me. I thought, oh, they're just human. But all of that, being a young person journalist in that position, helped me understand that we are all flawed humans and I don't need to be intimidated speaking to Jerome Powell or Tony Blair or Bill Clinton, I should respect everything they've done and their position. But at the end of the day, they're just people. So it's okay to have a conversation with them. And I worry that today with so much social media, so many people focused on a screen, not interacting, that they're losing that ability. 
and it could it, it could hurt people from having really great relationships or asking good questions from people who've accomplished a lot. What was your biggest challenge in journalism? What do you feel like you overcame personally? Yeah. I mean, there was just so much I had to learn. When I finished grad school, and I can talk about grad school if you like later, but the first job I had after grad school was with Dow Jones. And the first six months for training, they put you on a night editing desk. And you edit copy that comes in. And then when you're sure it's clean and factually correct, it goes out on the news wires and gets disseminated around the world. And I literally had to get a map of Asia and color code the countries. And I wrote the capitals in big, bold letters with a Sharpie and stuck it up with tape in front of my computer because even though I thought I had a very good education, understanding global geography, global politics, global economics, it's just not something I had learned deeply at that point. And, and so I had to teach myself. That was humbling. And it gave me a really good appreciation about how much there is for everyone to know and how connected the world is. We, again, we talk about deglobalization, fragmentation today. Whether we like it or not, we're irrevocably interlinked. And yeah, you need to understand where Jakarta is and what's going on in Indonesia versus Malaysia. Most people don't appreciate that Malaysia is an absolutely critical part of the supply chain for semiconductors. People think about Taiwan, of course, but Malaysia also has a really big role. This tiny little country, I think most Americans, especially in their early 20s, couldn't find on a map. And yet you need to understand what's going there because it affects something that's going to allow you to power up your computer, drive your car, turn on your home. So that was, again, like going to France for this first time, getting that initial training in journalism, making me realize how much I didn't know and how humble I needed to be to figure it out. And I'm really grateful for that. How is what you do like journalism and how is it unlike journalism? Journalism is my secret weapon because I learned to think critically. I learned to filter out news from noise. I learned how to communicate my thoughts concisely and quickly and think on my feet. And I think that serves me extremely well. As a journalist, you're constantly trying to understand the world. Your job is to learn and educate. What a gift. And as an investor, your job is to learn and invest and educate, right? Educate to the degree you're talking to clients or publishing, but you can't invest until you learn. And so the learning pro process as a journalist is not that different from an investor, except being an investor, it's usually significantly more quantitative. So for example, Tony Blair's election. I covered his election. And what did this mean? What did this new set of politics and this different approach mean for the UK economy? And what does that mean for UK asset prices? I would go to Brussels frequently for what they call ECOFIN meetings, the meetings of the finance and economic ministers as they were trying to figure out what the euro should look like, what monetary union would look like. And that was another one in terms of just training your brain. I, since I spoke French and a little Italian, they sent me to cover the French and Italian press conferences. Now this is before the Euro. So we had French francs and Italian lira and German Deutschmarks. And so I would be sitting there listening to this finance minister talking about their debt GDP ratio and new fiscal programs and talking about millions of lira. And I have my big brick phone on my ear. Maybe it wasn't a brick at that point. It was probably a Nokia, but it was still, it didn't fold, it was large. And I would have an editor in London listening. So I would be listening to the press conference, translating in my head lira to dollars, praying I did it well, and then also translating Italian to English in terms of what is the main thing he's saying? What's the story? And then narrating that to the editor who's typing it into a computer because we didn't have little cute laptops back then. And then they would put it out on the wire. But thinking on your feet like that, how lucky am I that I had to do that? Because now if I'm on live television or I'm getting Q&A and at an event with an important audience, I've done it for so many years, it just comes second nature to me. It's not scary. 
So you had a policy interest, but what about what really sparked your interest in investing? Oh, currencies. I'm a complete currency geek. I think currencies are the intersection of everything. If you think about the currency market, and they always tr they trade in pairs, so it's always relative, right? Is the U.S. economy stronger than Europe's? Do, what's the U.S. trade balance versus Europe's? What kind of capital flows are going in and out of the two countries? What are interest rates going to do in the two places? And then you have to put on top of that investor psychology, and you have to put on top of that geopolitical risk. And so you have to be constantly weighing these things across countries and then with a global overlay and a sentiment overlay, and it's changing real time. So it's like a game of chess that's never ending, and you're always trying to figure it out. You never master it. And that was the first thing I had to do at the journal. And it was hard, but it was so interesting to me because it took the politics, the policy, the economics, all of it together. And if you wanted to be good at currencies, you needed to understand everything else because the dollar you know, in the last year or so, part of it has been strong because the U.S. was raising rates faster than other countries that made the yield on U.S. assets more attractive than other assets. But part of it is that the U.S. economy was just stronger than other economies, we have a greater weighting in our stock indices on tech companies that had great cash balances that were buying back shares, they were attractive, and so foreign capital was coming here for that. And that net flow of capital to the US, whether it's for bonds, for certain types of stocks, for whatever, private equity, was supporting the dollar even though we had a current account deficit, which means we need capital inflows to offset the dollars we're selling to buy foreign goods. But just understanding how those things come together helps you understand equity markets. It helps you understand bond markets. You have to understand monetary policy. So learning about currencies helped me start learning about all the other asset classes. It's like you found your way in. Yeah. And I guess I should say, how did I get in, right? So. It was fun. I'm an accidental banker. I was happily riding away in London in 1997 and JP Morgan called me and said, we read your stuff in the newspaper and the wires and we think you get it and we want to hire you. And I said, I don't know anything about banking, really. And I think going to France that first time and leaping into the unknown made it easier to leap that next time from journalism to banking. So I joined. <laughs> and I joined in September 1997. Okay. There were a few things going on. So I landed in the middle of the Asian currency and I was doing currency I'm and sorry, commodity September research. September 1997 in London oh, or in yeah, New York? Yeah, in London. In, in London. London. Okay. So I had to cover, I covered currency markets and precious metals. So I had to come up with forecasts and I was diving into the deep end. I didn't know how to properly run regressions. I didn't know my way around Excel terribly well yet and then the markets were in turmoil. I was working six, seven days a week, very long hours, because I needed to get up the curve as fast as I could, but it was fascinating. It was exhilarating. And I, as a journalist, you have to ask questions, so you learn to be humble. So I would just say to my colleagues, can you teach me this? I need to understand how to do this. And people were lovely and taught me, so I figured it out. So my job was to produce forecasts Okay. So I had to tell you, is the yen going up or down? When do you start buying the Russian ruble? When do you stop selling the Indonesian rupiah? And so it would be, in the case of the Indonesian rupiah or the Asian currencies, it was understanding the IMF agreements to bail out these countries, to, get, to prevent them from running out of reserves. It was understanding when things would get so cheap that exports would start kicking in. And in the case of the euro, it was fun. It was my first model, which I only helped on the sidelines with. It wasn't mine per se yet, but we were starting to build models back then. These were really early days, not that sophisticated. But in this case, we were trying to predict where the European currencies would join the euro because they all had to converge with the Deutschmark at certain rates. And so you could trade these currencies on whether they were rich or cheap versus where you thought they'd converge. And that became a very popular trade in the late 90s ahead of the start of Euro on January 1st, 1999. So we built a model based on the convergence criteria and what was going on, 
that tells you how to trade them and it, it worked pretty well. It was fun. A second model we built was risk appetite. And then we built another one on economic surprises. And those latter two models still exist today. So we clearly did something okay. Let's dig into that a little because I'd be interested in how strategy has changed over time and how JP Morgan put strategy together then and how it evolved while you were there. Yeah, again, back then, research websites were just getting going. I think we had our first research website maybe in 1998 or 99, probably 98. And so we all had to learn how to program enough that we could put our research onto the website. There wasn't a whole department that did that initially. You did that? Oh yeah, I was in the research department, but it was we were vertically integrated. I researched, I wrote my research, I formatted my charts, I put everything into something at the time called PageMaker, sure. and then we would code it and get it up on the website. Yeah. So this was the very early days of that. And I'll never forget to tell you how early it was when I first, I moved to Singapore with JP Morgan in early 1999, and I was seeing a central bank in the region, leaving names out, and I was there to show them JP Morgan's cool research website and I got there and I brought my laptop and I brought some, some decks with me. And I said, okay, it's probably better if I can get on your computer and show you how to log in. They didn't actually have the internet in their office yet. They didn't realize you needed this connection to the internet to actually access these things called websites. I'll never forget that. I said, well, it's okay, it's okay. I can show you what it'll look like once you get going. And so I pulled up screenshots on my computer and we worked through it and then we followed up quickly and made sure that they got hooked up. But that's how early days it was. Not everyone had it and some thought they had it, which is interesting. But research, we would have regular calls to talk about what was going on in the world and our views and hash that out. I think that's still true today. How did you hash it out? How do you come up with consensus internally? At the end of the day, one person makes a final decision. And I think that's, uh, different banks have different approaches and different firms have different approaches. JP Morgan back then would have a house view. And if you, were, if you didn't agree with it and you got overruled, which happens, then when you were talking to a client about a view, you would just say, okay, our house view is this and here's the rationale for it. Personally, I think if it's not correct, it's because this and this may play out differently. And so you could stick to the house view, but lay out different possible scenarios. And that was fine. How did they come up with the house view? Lively internal debates where after everyone got their thoughts out, the top of the department would make a final call. I think that's largely still the case today. Someone has to make a call. At the end of the day, someone's got to own the view. And so what was your career there like? I got to do a tour of duty so started in London, moved to Singapore in 1999. And by then I was just getting the hang of Europe. I spoke French, Italian, a little German. I got my European currencies. And then I got to Asia and I'll never forget the first forecast I put out, the first trade idea I had was with the Philippine peso. And I didn't appreciate the differences or the magnitude of the differences. So in the Philippines, remittance flows, people working overseas and sending money home is a big capital flow that affects their currency, but it's not a big capital flow for most European countries. A little bit in Turkey, but in the major European countries, not at all. And so I wasn't putting enough weight on that variable and my call was completely wrong because of that. And so it was very embarrassing, but it was also a great lesson learned that there are differences around the world. Now, back then in the 90s, you didn't have, again, the democratization of data and information that we have today. So there was actually an information advantage being there, being on the ground, talking to the policymakers in person, going to the large companies, seeing what their business was doing, talking to consumers, getting an idea of sentiment. And you could take that information and share it with colleagues in New York or London and they would have an advantage. Today, it's the world is flat. You can get not quite all of it, but a lot more of it instantaneously on the online, which, which makes it a harder game in some ways. You don't have an advantage just from being on the ground or a smaller one anyway. But it was great being there and I'm so grateful for it. And so what was your transition like from 
J.P. Morgan to Bessemer. So I moved back to the States from Singapore in 2002, and I had continued along at J.P. Morgan, gone back to school to get an MBA part-time and do some more econometrics and finance, which was useful. And then Mary Erdos and I met and she said, why don't you come over to the private bank and run a trading desk for me? And again, it was one of those, okay, leap into the unknown. I had spent 10 years at that point telling people where markets were going and telling them what to do. And here was a chance to actually own the risk. And so I thought, yeah, let's do that. Of course, just like starting JP Morgan in 97, I started doing this in 2008. So was running a global currency and commodity trading desk for the private bank in the middle of some pretty incredible volatility. And what was great about that is I realized how much I loved it. There were days that I didn't love it, of course. It was a traumatic period of time. So many people losing jobs and the possibility of huge banks just disappearing, if you did. And at the same time, the opportunity to help clients through it was important, communicating daily with them, sometimes multiple times a day. And then when you got into 2009, some of the opportunities, they were once in a lifetime trades. And that was amazing. I'm so grateful I lived through it. I did two stories with that one. So part of my mandate was gold. And you can imagine in 08, 09, different people calling and saying, I need gold coins delivered to my house now. And, uh, and if I could tell you, I can't, who called me, I either thought, okay, I should be much more scared because these people must know something, or they shouldn't be in the seats they're in if they're that scared because they're panicking rather than doing what they need to do. But it was, it, it, I'll never forget it. And then in 2009, at one point, oil prices were down, I think we were down like $15 a barrel. And I just thought, gosh, oil has intrinsic value. It can't go much lower for very long. And at this point, the Fed had already been cutting rates. OPEC was adding, or sorry, cutting production to try to support the market. And so we thought, how do we take advantage of this? And at the time, the oil market had what they call very negative carry. So people expected the prices to bounce. So to break even, you needed the price to go at least to what was already priced in. And then to make money, it had to go beyond that. So that's when I started thinking about, I don't want to do a trade in oil. I want to do a trade in things correlated with oil that have a positive carry, a positive interest rate. And that started leading me to thinking about what's the best way to express a view. You shouldn't limit yourself to a single asset class. If you have a strong view, what's the optimal way to express it? It's not always the direct way. So in that case, you could buy a basket of oil-related currencies whose underlying economies export a lot of oil, for example, Canadian dollar, Norwegian crown, stuff like that. You could buy bonds that where the country is heavily linked to the oil market. You could buy oil-related equities if you also thought equities were nearing a bottom. You could buy a basket of differentiated assets all tied to oil, which in aggregate gave you more diversification, correlation to oil, and a positive carry. So there were it was a great moment because it opened my eyes to everything that's possible when you're investing, which probably helped me later on at Bridgewater and certainly at Bessemer. So tell me about the Bessemer job. Bessemer, a lot of history, was a family office, yep. was converted into a private wealth manager and then became a real contender and started gathering assets right about the time that you arrived. Yeah, I joined there in mid-2012. As much as I love J.P. Morgan, I had been asked to be chief strategist for asset management, which I enjoyed a lot, but I missed trading and handling risk. And there just aren't that many seats available. And so when Bessemer approached me, I just thought this gets me into a seat I would love to have. I think I'm ready to have. And it was, I was there eight years. It was a tremendous experience. They gave me a lot of autonomy to shape my team. I had a hundred person investment team We managed about $85 billion at the time, half of it internally, half externally. We could start new strategies if we thought they would help our clients. If something wasn't good enough, I would try to turn it around. And if it didn't work out, you get rid of it. We looked for ways to get creative with our private assets and our hedge funds to get better risk-adjusted returns, to reduce 
the J curve on the private assets, that period of time where you're getting capital calls but no return back yet. I created an overlay vehicle so I could let my portfolio teams, whether they were stocks, bonds, they should do what they think is best. And then as I look at the aggregate of that, if I think, gosh, what they think is best gets me too much exposure to, I'm making it up, Europe or technology or banks. I want to have a way to neutralize that if I think it could hurt us, but not Bigfoot on the portfolio managers because they should get their track record, keep them separate. And so having an overlay to use when needed was a way for me to represent my best thinking at the portfolio level and still let their track records be clean. So we did a bunch of things like that during the time I was there. That was just so much fun. And and it helped too that we had good performance. That always helps. We beat our benchmark, I think, six out of the eight years I was there after fees by quite a bit. And I loved working with the clients. Every family is different. Some are not sophisticated and they need education. Some are incredibly sophisticated. Some are very large and really set up shop more like an endowment or even a sovereign wealth fund. It's not a traditional 70-30. And so you need to really think about what are their goals? What are, what's their situation? How do I create the right investment vehicle for them? So we did have model portfolios that we started with, but then there was a lot of customization among the clients to make sure they got what they needed. That was a lot of fun. Did you learn anything from any particular clients? Oh, I learned a lot from a lot of clients. One of of my favorite things about working with high net worth families in general is uh, learning how they got where they got. If you had a current or former CEO, you're spending time together talking about their family, their retirement, their portfolio. Inevitably, you end up talking a little bit about the business. And so, whether it's someone who developed a huge global oil company or someone who got very wealthy developing a spa chain that went viral and went global. It just, to me, it's so interesting to understand on the micro level, all these companies that come together and form the aggregate economy. So some of it was lessons learned about personalities and leadership approaches, some of the former CEO types. I had some former government officials. I had some hedge fund principals. And get you learn something from everybody. And again, it goes back to my start as a journalist. Getting to talk to everybody is a gift. You're going to learn something from everyone you talk to. You just listen. So it was a joy. And you also learn about their challenges. I don't want to say poor little rich kid. Making sure that money gets passed through generations in a good way and that you're able to leave whatever your family's values are that can be really hard for some families. And so trying to help them through that too. Being CIO of a firm like Bessemer has parallels to family office, single family office CIO. What's a good way to think about putting your team together, coming up with your strategy in the sense a Mm -hmm. lot of folks have limited resources when they're talking about a single family office? That was gonna be my first point. I think you just hit the nail on the head. What's your goal? First, what's your goal? What are you building this for? Don't do it for ego, don't do it for stature. Why are you doing it and what's the goal? And then build out the staff or the resources you need to reach the goal accordingly, but don't do more than you need to. I think one thing I saw frequently were people who built pretty complex family offices and then they'd get older and their kids didn't wanna have to deal with it and then they'd have to unwind it all. So I think building a family office is fine, it's great, but know why you're doing it. Be confident that you need to go down that road rather than using a multifamily office or a combination of resources outside to do it. Finding a lot of people want a family office so they can do more direct illiquid investments, for example. How many people do you need to do that? How good are they gonna be? Are you gonna be able to pay them what they need to be paid to work for you versus going to work at a private equity shop? Do you wanna spend that much money? Are they gonna actually see the deal flow if they're just sitting by themselves in your family office rather than being in a bigger ecosystem? I'm not saying it can't be done, I see it done all the time, but there are definite challenges to it, which again gets me to be very crisp on what you need and why you're doing it. How would you contrast your process at Bessemer versus JP Morgan and maybe the cultures as well? Sure, JP Morgan's private bank is very large and there are a lot of different types of clients, both 
level of wealth, level of sophistication goals. Some of them are build me a great portfolio that I know will be fine and I'm just going to check in once a quarter when I get a statement. There are others who say, I want great trade ideas whenever you see something and they're active traders and a part of their portfolio is set aside for that. So JP Morgan has the breadth and depth that it can do a great job covering all sorts of different types of families and entities. Bessemer is a smaller shop, although not small, and is not trying to be your, I'm going to give you five trades a week firm. That's not what they're good at. That's not what they do. What they're trying to do is say, we're going to be your one-stop shop for your portfolio, your trust and estate advice, your tax advice, your philanthropic advice, anything your family needs. And we're going to wrap all that up effectively into one fee. We're going to keep it super simple for you and have a high number of relationship people covering each family so they really know that family in depth. So they're just, they're very different business models. And I think both of them have a role to play out there. It depends what the person who is lucky enough to have the wealth is trying to do. You need to pick who's going to manage your money depending on what your goals are. If you just want to have I want market exposure. I want to keep it cheap. I'm not going to try to beat the market. I just want to get it invested wisely and let it go. You can do that with a handful of ETFs. You don't need to pay anyone anything. But some so what people, are you paying for? ETFs, I think, have a role in pretty much every portfolio. If you are getting beta, if you're just getting market exposure, and I can get an ETF for two basis points and get US large cap stocks or global stocks for a couple basis points or liquid US bonds, that could be a good piece of my portfolio. It's cheap, it's liquid, it gets me my exposure. But if I'm paying a fee to someone, I wanna do better than just get the market return. If you're paying a fee, you wanna get more than market exposure. So you want someone who is going to be able to find managers that can find opportunities and get you alpha, get you something better than the market, or you're going to want something unique that's going to get you a diversification for your portfolio that'll reduce the risk of your portfolio. That's also something worth paying for. You want someone who's going to be able to see the business cycle, the market cycle, be able to time at least generally when to get in and out. That's worth a fee. If you find someone who can bring you some combination of those things, the diversification, the market timing, the alpha or excess return, I'm fine paying a fee for that, but then you better deliver it. So a bit of a specific question, but it comes up a lot now since there's been so much growth in the RIA space, so many mergers, so many big firms, is how does a firm like Bessemer, how do some of these big RIAs compete for talent? Different firms are gonna have different things that make them attractive to different people. I know that's a horribly generic answer, Most of these people want to get paid, that's table stakes, but then there's also different cultures. There's going to be different approaches to work from home, work from anywhere versus be in the office. There's going to be some people who want to do the five trade ideas a week and some people who prefer being the steward of that family's capital. So I think a firm like Bessemer has a certain culture. They have a very high ratio of coverage people for clients. It's more the stewardship approach. I think they make sure they pay competitively, but it's going to attract a certain type of investor to that shop versus somewhere else where maybe you are coming up with more frequent trade ideas, you're making changes more frequently in a portfolio, working with different types of clients with different goals. I I think it all works out okay, but I haven't seen anything to suggest that Bessemer is not able to hire great people. I think the team they have is incredibly strong. So speaking of culture, Mm. let's start talking about Bridgewater. So while I had a great experience at Bessemer, I had joined a Federal Reserve Committee. I've been doing things with the Fed on and off my entire career, and I love to be able to help them. I think what they do is super important. And I got to know Ray Dalio on this New York Fed Investor Advisory Committee. And on this committee, it was, it, I felt like the kid at the grown up table for Thanksgiving a little bit because it was Jim Chanos, Paul Tudor Jones, Ray Dalio, on and on, and me. And, uh, but again, you realize they're just humans. They're billionaire humans, but they're humans. And you're at the table for a reason. So take a deep breath and go. 
So we would get tagged with presenting on different topics. We'd all take turns. And the president of the Fed would be there initially. It was Bill Dudley and then John Williams for us, and then senior staff. And I presented, and I wasn't intimidated. And if I disagreed with Jim Chanos or whomever, I would push back. And I think what Ray saw was someone who is hopefully a good thinker and not afraid to stick their neck out if they have a view and was comfortable at the table. And so he started saying, you should think about coming to Bridgewater. And I thought, that's interesting. And I did my research. I know it is a unique firm and a challenging firm, but I also wanted a challenge. I was ready for my next stretch. And I thought, gosh, nothing's gonna stretch me more than going to Bridgewater. I went in for a morning meeting. So every Monday, the entire investment department gathers in person or on video and discusses a research packet that they go through over the weekend and what they're thinking about the markets. And at the beginning of the meeting, we sit down at this big table, the TV camera's going, and Ray says, this is Rebecca. Rebecca, why don't you kick us off? What do you think is the most important thing going on in the world? Now, what he didn't say is in the next day, the next month, this year, your lifetime, so time frame matters, but he wasn't giving me that. And I just thought, okay, I'll go for the next year. And so I talked for a few moments and then he said, okay, thank you, Rebecca. Everybody grade her. So everybody pulls out their laptops or their iPads and starts giving me what Bridgewater calls dots, which are grades. And that is part of the firm's culture of radical transparency, that the idea is if we all trust each other and we all truly want to make each other better, we should give each other feedback, both to call out when they do something well, but also when they could do something better or differently, and that might help them. And so whenever you have an important meeting or a presentation or whatever, you have the opportunity to leave people dots and comments with them. It's not just a random dot. You see who it's from, and they can also explain why they gave you that grade. And you never worry about one specific grade. It doesn't matter. It's like a Surat painting. It's all the dots together that form a picture of you over time. That's what matters. But of course, I had never been dotted. And so I'm sitting there in this room and people are dotting me and I leaned over to a person sitting next to me and saying, can you explain this to me? And I think she had given me a six and seven is considered at the bar. So this, I was a below the bar, so that wasn't good. I think overall I got a six or seven, which actually is pretty good there because they grade hard. But it was great because I went home that day and said, how do I feel about that? If that's my life, I'm constantly getting dots from everyone in the firm. Can I handle that? Can my ego handle that? I thought, yeah, as long as they're doing it meaning well, meaning to help me, and as long as I can take it that way, then sure, why not? So that was a big part of the interview process. And then later I came in and they asked me to explain how I would pick what countries I would be overweight or underweight in equities, how I, what my process was to do that. And, and I had a couple days to build a presentation for them on that. And that was interesting too, because I thought, do they want me to create a system with coding? Do they want me to use data? Do they want me to use case studies? And they didn't, it was up to me to figure out. But I went in a few days later and presented and we had a good conversation. And, and I guess I did well enough that they felt good taking a chance on me. I think Ray favors people who can think conceptually and can come up with the concepts on their own. Uh, so clearly uh, that's what that test is. I, I think you're right. I think he, he is a conceptual thinker, and I think he sees me as a conceptual thinker. And I think my global experiences and experiences working in different asset classes also helps me, probably more than some, connect dots, right? Speaking of dots, like being able to look at export orders from an Asian economy and know immediately what that means for U.S. industrial production three months later or to look at what's going on in the banks in the United States and think about, okay, where could that contagion spread globally? And what have I seen historically that could lead me to different views? And I think he saw that in me as well. But it was, yeah, it wasn't as scary as some people make it sound to be, frankly. Twitter's very systematic, but they mm -hmm. also take a great interest in the macro and having an opinion on the macro. Is that something that is debated in-house or is it something that is developed because it's part of great client service. I guess what I'm asking is Bridgewater looking for a kind of single truth. Bridgewater is all about the truth. It's so interesting. 
because it is a, they invest quantitatively in that they use very sophisticated models that are developed over decades to decide how the portfolio looks at a given point in time. But behind those models and behind the coding is years and years of research. And basically you want to look for a relationship. So if, I don't know, consumers in the United States are strong, they're probably spending more, which means more revenue for companies, which is gonna be good for their share price. That's a very simple statement and it's probably true. But you can't just say, well, it's probably true. Then you have to find, how do I test that hypothesis? What's the data I use? What's the right data? What's the right time frame to look at that data? And you can't just say, let's take the last 10 years. You wanna look at that over the last 100 years. And you don't wanna just assume it's true for the United States. You wanna make sure it's true universally. So things that go into Bridgewater's systems have been tested over long periods of time, different conditions, different countries, because you don't want to get lulled into thinking that a short-term correlation is a truth. It's the underlying rationale that drives the relationships. That's the truth. And so there was to put something new into the system that would influence the portfolios was an incredibly challenging process. And your colleagues would come back and ask questions and debate It would be, it's a fairly intense process, but again, in the interest of making sure it was right, not to tear you apart, not to say you're not good enough, but just, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Maybe you should look at it this way. So it was the most rigorous research I've ever done in my life. Is the system zero discretion or do they just have a different definition of discretion? The portfolio is designed by the systems which are the result of the research. That said, there are people looking at the output of the systems 24 seven and making sure that the positions that are being suggested make sense. Looking for something that might not, you go do a deep dive immediately, make sure you haven't missed something. I don't know what that would be. And then Certainly there are meetings regularly where the CIOs and others will go through the portfolio thinking about it. Does this match our best understanding of the world? And if they don't, you go do some research and make sure you haven't missed something. The trick with that is you never want to optimize for your emotional thinking at a given point in time. And I found throughout my career, not just Bridgewater, that is the biggest risk you run. If you build a system and you've tested it, then you need to trust the system. If you're overriding it, then it doesn't mean much. So there's a balance there. But even folks like Two Sigma admit that they have tactical occasions. Yeah, and yeah. I think Bridgewater would say they do too, but you wanna keep that, you wanna keep the bar very high to override something. I was up at HBS this weekend talking mm-hmm. to some folks about Bridgewater and some of the pushback from them is that they worry that the dot collection and feedback would overwhelm the system to some extent in the sense that you would spend so much time on critique. When do you have time to actually do the work? Uh, it's that, so that's, I think that's, that's a, a misunderstanding. While feedback is an important part of the culture, the investment engine, which is what they call the research department, the focus is just how do we understand the world? What are we missing? What don't we understand as well as we want to? Let's go do that. And giving the feedback is important and it's ongoing, but it's something that's done quickly. It is not taking an inordinate amount of time. The goal is, primary goal is, let's make sure we have a deeper, better understanding of the world than anyone else. That's all they wanna do, which is not an easy task. So let me ask you the Matt Levine question, which is, does the Bridgewater culture ultimately contribute to profits? And if so, why don't others use it? I think that a lot of the culture is incredibly additive. Again, there are days where your ego doesn't feel like listening to the dots and no one's forcing you to go look at your dots every day or even every week. I think it's useful to look at them and learn from them, but It's not a, you didn't look at your dots in the last 48 hours, what's wrong with you? If you can give people the benefit of the doubt that the feedback they leave you is meant to help you be better at your job, that's a gift. 
the reality is there are days where your ego just says, I can't, not today. And I do think for some people, they're just, they just don't want to hear it all the time. And so there are going to be some firms where the culture is a little more passive aggressive, frankly. They'll tell you fabulous to your face and then the negative feedback will be said in closed door room and you're not there. So I think Bridgewater's culture ultimately does help Bridgewater, but not everyone wants to or can manage getting constructive feedback as frequently as you do there. I, again, I learned early on as a journalist, leave your ego at the door. And I think that helped me there. But yeah, there were some moments I'm like, ugh, I can't. <laughs> I'll look tomorrow. Now, Bridgewater is supposed to be an iterative culture versus most other firms on the street, which are top down. Do you think that's accurate? I think it's a, I mean, my own personal view is it's a mix. Certainly, you need leadership to set the direction of the firm. Someone needs to be accountable and say, we're going to march this direction. But you hopefully get lots of feedback from people who are talking to the clients every day or building the systems or doing the trading or whatever. And I do think that the culture there with the constant feedback helps that, right? So the feedback goes up as well as down. And so if a decision is being made in the executive committee to go march in a certain direction, there will be plenty of opportunity for people at different levels of the firm to say, that's an interesting idea, but have you thought about X? And maybe they have and maybe they haven't. But that kind of feedback and the questioning is encouraged. And I think at the margin, it is useful. And I think most firms try to do that. I don't know how many are really effective at it. So I think net it was a positive thing. This isn't specific to Bridgewater, but mm -hmm. how do you think firms should handle the founder problem? And the reason I bring it up is because we've got some major firms right now. We have Renaissance, we have Tudor, we have Berkshire, we mm -hmm. have Bridgewater, all of these Carlisle. firms. Carlisle. Yeah, there's a bunch. Founder transitions are really tough. Ray announced he was going to transition out over a decade ago, and it's really just now happened. I, I applaud David McCormick, the former CEO, and Nir Bardea, the current CEO, and others for ensuring they got through it, because it's not easy. People who found companies, it's their baby, it's their ego, it's their life. It's hard to let go, and I'm not saying that specifically about Bridgewater, I'm just speaking generally. And at Bessemer, I dealt with lots of founders and lots of CEOs in that position, and th their, their whole self-worth was wrapped up in that. And so letting it go can be so hard. It's a dangerous time for a company. And I think it can be, in general, a very distracting time for a company because they're spending so much time on ensuring a smooth transition rather than worrying about the day-to-day -day business. And so the more smoothly and effectively can they get through it, the better off for the company, the employees, the clients. I think Bridgewater has now gotten to the other side. It'll be interesting with some of these other firms you mentioned with the transitions going on how quickly and smoothly they get to the other side. Did you ultimately find that the Bridgewater process clarified your thinking? I reflect now on my three years at Bridgewater and I think I am a better researcher for the experience. But in particular? So it's like working with a bunch of five-year-olds who say, why? I have teenage girls now, so they don't do that anymore. But back in the day, mommy, why? And the research process was similar. I would say, of course, if the Fed does this, yields will do that. Why, Rebecca? What is the justification for that? Have you tested it? You go test it, come back. Yeah, but why? And so you had to go deep and deep. You can't be a lazy researcher. You have to be incredibly deep. You have to think about all the ways you might be wrong. And even then, what am I missing? And I think what that does is it reduces the risk you're wrong. It doesn't mean you won't be wrong, but you've spent more time thinking about all the different permutations and angles of a question, and it increases the likelihood you're right. And in investing, every point you get right matters, right? Most successful investors are right 52% of the time. If you're super lucky, maybe 55, maybe a little higher. So getting each of those answers right adds a lot. And I think that's what I got out of being there. So here's a specific question. I think a lot of folks would be fascinated by this is how are the daily observations written? Oh, I tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. I don't think they would mind me sharing. 
at JP Morgan, when I first started writing research, we had dailies, weeklies, monthlies, quarterlies. And so I was used to doing and writing research. Bridgewater is fairly unique among investment management firms like them that they publish five days a week and now a weekend piece as well and have podcasts. A gentleman named Jim Haskell oversees the process. He's great. So every Monday you talk about what's in the pipeline. What are people working on? And not everyone in the research department writes research. It's senior people. And so a handful of us would gather and talk about what we were thinking about, what we were working on. If we had an idea that needed some shaping or some brainstorming, we had a separate meeting for that for people who wanted help brainstorming about ideas. Some things you would turn around in a day or even a few hours. I had a few of those. I pulled on my wire writing experience to get me through those. Other times you might work on something for three or four weeks. You often were working on more than one piece at once you usually were not working alone. So everyone would help each other. I might be writing about Europe and I would wanna to talk to my colleagues in the fixed income group and the equity group and the currency group and get their different perspectives and pull that into what I was doing. I might get a few of them to help me with exhibits. So it was always a group effort, but you'd have one senior person who was shepherding it and owning it. And then once it was written, then you went through the review process and that's where it got, again, the high bar. Y you could have some intense discussions with colleagues over wording or was this chart good enough or clear enough? Did you have enough justification for the view? And that process could take hours. And then of course you had lawyers and external editors on top of that before it went out because this publication goes out to clients, but those clients are some of the largest institutional investors in the world, as well as policymakers. And you don't want anything to be wrong and you want it to be as good and insightful as it can be. It's a big part of the firm's reputation, I think. If you couldn't talk to anyone, would you still trust your own analysis? Yeah, I've been doing this 30 years. So I would hope by now, if I have a Bloomberg terminal and an internet connection, I can't talk to anyone. I, if I couldn't even read, if I could only look at data, I think I could still form a view. And this is something I did recently. I, I, I went to grad school the first time to Johns Hopkins, to SICE, and I had the opportunity to teach a class there recently to international finance students, and it was so fun. And the very last slide I showed them were the, if I only could look at 10 indicators, what would they be? And so I walked through what they were and why. Would you miss more? Yeah. But could you form a view? Sure. And in the broad scheme of things, you'd probably be right more than wrong, just with data. But as an extrovert, a former journalist, someone who gets a lot out of talking to people, I would miss the interaction tremendously. I talked to Noriel Rubini about this once, asking, where do you start? with a strategy and what the biggest problem is. And he said, it's a level of resolution. How do you find a way in? I usually am working in multiple time frames at once in my head. Mm -hmm. Most clients will get a statement once a month. And so I'm thinking, what's going to happen this month? And then they get a statement every quarter and then they make a review every year. And so I think even though they're arbitrary, they're still psychologically important for your clients. And so you need to be thinking, am I getting it right over these time frames? What things do I need to watch? Depending on the type of investor you are, you might not want to be trading monthly or weekly because it's going to cause a lot of churn and fees, but you want to understand what are the risks to your view over that period. So their time frame matters. I'll look at monthly, quarterly, annual, but then I also overlay five, 10 years out. One of the most interesting things to me right now is thinking about the energy transition in this movement to help the climate, which I think is incredibly important. There is going to be a mismatch, just like the deposits and loans at Silicon Valley. We're going to have a mismatch with available supply of fuel as we move to the green endpoint. And I think navigating through that at a minimum will create volatility and in a worst case scenario could create higher prices than people are planning on. 
and that's a five-year view. The CHIPS Act, the deglobalization, that's going to be a five-year view. Demographics, that's going to be a five, 10, 15-year view. But they're really important to overlay in your thinking <clears throat> because if you're only looking at the next payroll report or the next ECB meeting, the European Central Bank meeting, you could be missing these underlying currents that also have an influence. So you have to do both at once. And then with country versus factor versus sector versus global, you do all of it. So it's always a multi-dimensional matrix and you have to think about, I usually start globally. What, is, what does it look like with global growth? What are the percent of countries expanding versus contracting? What does global policy look like? What does global allocation look like, sentiment look like? Then I go down to, okay, which countries are driving that and what's happening in each of those? And then what are the sectors driving that, et cetera, et cetera. So I usually start big and go small, but that, there's no one way to do it. That's just what I do. How do you vet your own sources? How much does the media influence you? I'm sure you speak to a lot of folks who are they are they're politicians, they're, they're ministers, and you have to weigh how much of an agenda are you getting? When I'm working, I always assume that a policymaker, a corporate executive, someone with power is saying something for a reason. So you always have to take whatever you hear through that lens. Doesn't mean you should dismiss what they say, but you should be thinking skeptically about what they're saying. It also matters the venue in which they say it, right? We know that comments from the United States or China said to a domestic audience might be different than comments from the US or China said to an international audience for specific goals. And so the setting matters, why they're saying it matters. At the end of the day though, I still listen to everything they say. And then in terms of news sources, sadly it's changed a lot. When I started out in journalism at the Wall Street Journal, every fact in a story, you had to get corroborated from a second source. And even back then in the 90s, certain newspapers back then didn't do that. If one person said X, you could print it. But that one person saying X could be a disgruntled employee or a liar or who knows what. And so having the second independent source I thought was important to have credibility of what you read in the paper and you could trust it. So I learned early on to know the differences between the styles and the legal approaches of different newspapers and that shaped who I read. And then you have to know the political considerations behind the different outlets. Spending time in Europe early in my career, in Europe it was very normal that you would have a newspaper for the left party and a newspaper for the right party. In Italy, every major political party had its own TV channel. Now, this was decades before Fox and MSNBC. So now here, we're getting used to it. It's been like that for decades in Europe. <clears throat> but understanding, if I listen to the communist channel in Italy versus the, the capitalist channel, I'm going to get different versions of the news. So I, was, I learned early on how to listen to news that way and take it with a grain of salt, depending on where I was getting it. And in the States, you have to do that too now. What kind of advice would you give to a CIO about the kind of weight to, to give something like Twitter? I'm not on Twitter, so that's how much weight I give it. <laughs> I think there are incredibly smart, credible people who tweet, but I think the need for me to read a tweet from fill in the blank person instantly versus see it on their website a day or two later or hear them say it in a speech a day or two later, I'm not trading like that. I don't need that. And I find the noise to signal ratio of Twitter so high that I think I would lose years of my life just scrolling through and filtering out the noise. So I've made a decision, I'm not going there. And I'm sure I am missing some useful content, but to me, it is not worth the price. If you were hiring a good CIO, what would you look for? I would wanna know how they manage risk. So I would want to hear about some crisis they've lived through and how they managed through that, whatever their job was at the time, whether they were managing money or managing research or whatever, how do they deal when the stuff hits the fan? Because if their job is to be a steward of your capital, that's the thing that's, that you can't afford to make a mistake on. So that would be the first thing I'd look at. 
I would want to make sure their personality fit mine to the degree that we had shared values. I would want to make sure there's someone who's going to be able to hire good people to the degree they need to and that people are How do are you gonna... ascertain their values? <laughs> I always ask people when I interview them, after we get through the resume and what are you thinking about the markets today? I ask everyone and I tell them up front. I say, I always ask everyone this. So this isn't you. This isn't personal. What are you reading right now? If you're not reading something, what are a couple books you've read recently? And then I'll ask, what is a favorite book? You asked me that when we before we started talking today. And I told you, No Ordinary Time by Doris Kearns Goodwin, my all-time favorite history book. If someone doesn't have a couple books they read, that would be a question mark to me personally. I, and then I'll ask them, how do you follow the markets? And if their answer is I read the journal, I'll say goodbye. The journal would be important, but I would want to know that it's a heck of a lot more than that. How do I follow the markets? When I wake up at five, I start by looking at Bloomberg to see what happened overnight. And then I'll go read my aggregator sites and look at the Asian news. And then I'll come back and I'll skim the journal and the Times and the FT and the Washington Post. And then if someone just says they read the journal every morning, the, Again, great paper, but certainly not sufficient. How do you manage your media consumption? Again, because, of course, nowadays we could spend all day doing it. You could. And yeah. I'm an information junkie. I'll bet. And when I see research that I want to read, I will sometimes print it out, which I know is not environmentally friendly. Sometimes I'll put it into an electronic folder. And then on the weekends, when I have time, I make a big pot of coffee and I just close my door and I read for four or five hours. The Economist magazine has to be on your list, right? If you could only read one thing, you could read that every weekend and you'd have a pretty good idea what's going on in the world from a markets and economics point of view. So I have favorites. I have favorite people out there in the industry that I'll go to. I have favorite publications like The Economist, aggregator sites like John Ellis, and you can't read everything. So you go to what you know and what you've vetted, and then you just I ask people for recommendations. The other day I was talking to someone, we were talking about how the market is discounting that the Fed is gonna start cutting rates this summer, which seems highly unlikely to me that they would be able to cut that quickly without inflation Im immediately collapsing, which seems unlikely. And this person said, oh, did you read Matt Raskin's piece? At the, I'm like, aha, every conversation I have there's going to be some nugget like that. And then that goes into the must read pile. And so I'll keep post-it notes everywhere with things I need to read and come back to. So now that you've seen all of these different internal cultures, what would your ideal mm. company culture be? I love that question. If I were king or queen, I am a big believer, given my background in open lines of communication and transparency. I tried my best everywhere I was to give people feedback, honest feedback, but empathetic feedback. I don't think you have to be cruel to be honest. And I'm not saying others have been to me, but I, it does exist. But honest feedback to help people. And also, when they do well, be their cheerleader. Right? If someone does something, make sure they get credit for it. Call them out. I'm lucky enough that I've gotten here. So now it's my turn to help everybody below me and get them there, too. So give credit to the team, give credit to the new person. Feedback, being a cheerleader, helping develop people, taking time to understand where they're coming from. I, one of the quotes that always sticks with me is 1% of what a person's going through. So if you have a colleague who comes in and they're off their game, don't assume you know why, you don't. So the more you can get to know people and develop that trust and rapport, the more you can get the best out of them, the more they're going to trust you and be loyal to you, and you're going to have a great team. So I guess I'm leaning in my answer on a lot of the softer stuff. I feel like the skills, the work ethic is table stakes. I work my butt off. That's my choice. I'm a bit of a workaholic. I don't expect people to work the hours I do, but I expect them to care as much as I do. Rebecca Patterson, thank you for joining us and sharing your insights with us today. It was absolutely my pleasure. This was fun. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, please share it with your friends and take a minute to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. 
we appreciate it.